Uh, thanks, everyone. Is this on? Can you hear me? You can hear me? OK, good. Um, so this talk is called Simple, Fast, and Accessible. And fast is how I'm going to go through these slides, because I have 80 of them in uh, the next 20 minutes. So my first time that I did this talk, uh, or something similar, was you don't need a framework for that. And that was in 2011, when I came across code that's pulled in jQuery just for something you could do with a CSS selector. And I thought, you really don't need a framework for that. And then I redid the talk in 2015 when I worked at Visa and they used 43 dependencies for a form. And then on Wednesday, I decided to completely rewrite this talk when I hit this code example at the company I work at, which is a radio button that doesn't use a radio button or a label. Um, it actually does produce a radio button, but it doesn't have a name or a value attribute. And I freaked out, and I asked everyone I knew, what does, how do you write a radio button? And no one knew. So that is a sad statement, but one of the reasons you want to use basic HTML is because it's accessible. So let's talk a little bit about accessibility. This is what a site looks like if you're visually impaired. You're reading it with a screen reader, and all it's reading to you is everything that can get tab index, which often says, click here, click here, click here, click here. This is an awesome video that is just hysterical. Let me know what you think. Isn't that the funniest video you've ever seen and heard? There's no audio. We're all right now hearing impaired, because there is no sound on this. This could be at an airport. This could be anywhere. But it really doesn't come off it's that funny um, when you can't see it. And then there's people who are colorblind, or people like me who wear granny glasses so I can read. Um, and I can't read anything if it's dark out. Like, if I don't have enough light, I need serious color contrast, because I was born a decade before everyone else here. So disability is not necessarily being a in a wheelchair. Disability is any mismatch in the interaction between the features of your surrounding and of your personal being, as you are right now. So we've all benefited from laws like the ADA. God forbid I should ever have, my biggest fear is the one in the middle, not the one on the left. <laughs> um, but I take advantage of those sidewalks being low when I come to conferences like this, because I take my little carry-on with the little um, wheel, especially since I bought a new suitcase and the handle broke the first time I tried to lift it in the overhead bin. So I can only drag it. I can't actually lift it. So in terms of disabilities, you have some that are permanent, and you have some that are situational. Most people, actually everyone in this room, has had a situational disability. Whether it is right now, it's not dark enough, I mean, it's not light enough for um, you to read everything in the back row, probably. And one thing that HTML does for us is it provides accessibility. So things like radio buttons, or actually in terms of accessibility, it's a different slide later on. In terms of accessibility, it's not only important because every one of us will need some sort of accessibility features, and some of us need them all the time. But it's also useful, it's helpful to everyone. You know, those, cur those cut in the corner, um, in the curb, help me with my suitcase, even though they might have been built for a pram or a wheelchair. And it's the right thing to do, it's easy to do, and you know what? In a lot of countries, it's required. So which one of these is accessibility? It's all of the above. But since they're radio buttons, I can, with labels, I can just tab through, I mean, um, use my right arrow, left arrow, down arrow, and without any HTML, I can go right through them. Isn't that amazing? That's HTML for you. So if there is some time when you need to make something accessible, or when you need to use something that is not native, um, like you want to make a super button, um, that does some other feature. There is accessible, rich internet, um, accessible rich internet applications, also known as ARIA. The thing is, the first rule of ARIA, kind of like the first rule of Fight Club, is don't use ARIA. If there is a native HTML element or attribute that does what you need, use that. Use the built-in behavior instead. And the other thing to remember is that HTML is by default accessible. 
and fast. And it's our job as developers to not fuck that up. So let's talk a little bit about performance. This is a quote. Um, I don't know who this person is, but he said, I remember when 3G was primary mobile speed. It was slow, but it still worked. So why now, when my phone says 3G, it becomes completely useless? Some people blame their carriers. I blame this. In 2010, the average website was 700 kilobytes. Last week, the average website was five times that. Right? Your phone is not five times faster. That's a five-time difference. So we've been given some prescriptions, and these are the ones we usually know. Um, we need to optimize images, and the reason I crossed off um, avoid browser resizing, um, and that's actually supposed to be avoid image resizing, is because it used to be on the same thread and it used to slow down your site uh, really bad. And I know that in Chrome, um, that has improved a lot because it's uh, image resizing or decoding is done on a different th thread. I don't know if that's all browsers yet, so it was kind of a note for myself to look it, look it up. But there's a great article um, called Essential Image Optimization by Adi Osmani. Um, then there's a video optimization, and the rules are basically the same as image optimization. Number one is, for both of those, is if you can om omit an image or a video, do that. But one other trick is to remove the audio on your videos if you're going to have a hero video that doesn't actually ever play audio. People are sending the audio file down and then putting it on mute. Uh, so I wrote an article, uh, the link is right here, on how to optimize your images, I mean your videos. We've been given tools, lots of them. It started with Why Slow, which, has since been, which was abandoned like five years ago. But I want to give them cred because in 2006, Why Slow was created. And now we have a bunch of different tools to use on performance. This deck is online. You can access all of these resources. Everything that's blue is a link. Um, the most recent one, or the one I use the most, is uh, Lighthouse. And when it provides information on performance, there's four different things that it provides on. Progressive web apps, because that's a performant application. General performance. Best practices, because the better practices you use, the more performant your site is not just in terms of speed, but in terms of usability. And then accessibility, because if your site isn't accessible, it doesn't matter how fast it gets down the wire. Some of these uh, rules, like uh, Lighthouse isn't the only one that talks about uh, usability. Uh, Page Speed Insights did. And it gives some really important rules, like setting the viewport size, making your page legible, and uh, sizing it to, to the viewport. OK. so. Uh, many years ago, 2008 to be exact, well, first in 1998, WCAG came out with the first rules, set of rules. And then 10 years later in 2008, so 10 years ago, it came out with new rules, which are the exact same as before. They just categorized them into four headlines under perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. All of these things can be done by good, having good UX and using HTML. OK, so a few tips before I move on away from accessibility is user agents should never, ever sniff to see if there's um, a screen reader. Right now, it can't. But even when you can, that's their one right to privacy. They don't want people knowing that they have a disability um, or a difference. Don't do it um, if you ever can. And right now, you can't, thankfully. Um, if you're not using HTML, if instead you're using a framework or using JavaScript to create elements for not for you know, like not using semantic HTML, you have to manage focus. And every single step of the way has to be added with JavaScript. So the general rule is use browser defaults as much as possible. So we've talked about video optimization, and we've talked about image optimization. How about scripts? Uh, Hussein talked about that a lot, so I'm going to talk about making it smaller rather than making it faster. So. I showed you that Visa thing, which was 43 dependencies. They had several different frameworks, like who needs to put React and jQuery at the same time um, for what is a form. It's what I call RDD, resume-driven development. It's when you use what's easiest or what is the new shiniest thing without putting any thought process into it. But what happens when you do that is you get code like this. This code, that second line, which was added by a post processor, is a Microsoft call inside a WebKit keyframe. There's no, exactly, I'm getting a face going, what? 
the hell? So exactly, you don't, you, you're just wasting bytes. So what I urge you all to do is to think of frameworks in all of these libraries as scaffolding. If you're prototyping, use anything you want to see if your UX works. But once you want to go into production, get rid of all those dependencies. So I recreated the, the site, this form, um, without any dependencies. And this was the web page test difference. That's Vs up top, and that's my version on the bottom. And just as a slight comparison, this is their load time, and this is mine. <laughs> OK? So it does little nifty things, like um, you can have a country selector down here, and you can um, have a little carousel that works, all without frameworks. So I came up with some solutions. The idea is originally all of these frameworks were created because all browsers were different, and you just had to equalize them. And that was why jQuery became so popular. If that's not what you're doing, well, this one is from 2003. It said basically, does it support ID and layers and everything else? So now I want you to stop just thinking what, what framework is the fastest to do it and think to yourself, how can I do this simply? So to start off, you need to know what HTML does. This is by Mike Taylor, um, who works at Mozilla, but I think this was created before he even worked at Opera. And it's basically all of the attributes of, eight, of form controls. So everything is really well supported. The two things that are red, one is uh, deprecated, and the other one has, the spec isn't done yet, I don't think. So you can use HTML5 forms, or even HTML forms, but you need to know what they do. So let's start a little bit with accessibility. The first thing I want to talk about is the label. A label is supposed to be associated with a form control. And that is what the assistive technology will read by default. And that's all you need to do. No ARIA required. It is an HTML element of, called label with the for attribute. And the value of the for attribute matches the ID of the form control. Pretty nifty, easy, whatever. Um, if you don't include it, the browsers are super forgiving, as are assistive technologies, and it'll read the placeholder. If you don't have a placeholder, it will read the title. If you don't have a title, a placeholder, or a label, you should be fired, because you're not writing proper, you, you don't know what you're putting out there. If you want to add features to it and make it even more accessible, you can put the ARIA label and actually put the text, and it'll read that instead. However, if you have an ARIA label by, and you can indicate other, the IDs of other elements, it will, um, it will read those instead. So it's just really simple. Um, you know. Okay, so this was what I showed you earlier. And here is the code. Uh, this is actually the Ember Widgets radio button that doesn't use label and that does not use the name attribute or the value. And it produces this as code. So it says div Ember 500 input ID class type radio. So all it gets is the fact that it's a type of radio button, and so it puts up a radio button. And everything else that makes it work, because it actually does work, um, is done in JavaScript. But this has no JavaScript, and I am able to navigate through all of these, and you can see that they're selected because I'm using CSS to um, style it a little bit to make it more visually not pleasing, because it's not pleasing, um, but at least more noticeable. Um, so, radio was defined in 1993. So, when I ask you on an interview question, what, how do you make a radio button, let me read this to you. For attributes, we can take a single value from a set of alternatives. That's when you want to use the radio button. Each radio button in the, name in the group should be given the same name. The name attribute associates all the ones as being from the same group. And that's all the answer to that question that so many people failed over the past week. So this is what their code was, which was div class radio row, radio button value equals true, span class, blah, 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 blah. If they had just written this, which is just a slight change um, when they created it, given a button group, um, and said label, and then put a span, or otherwise actually just put label and then the word false, right? This would have been so much better, and it would have been helpful to the people who are using that framework, because a lot of engineers, or some people who call themselves uh, front-end engineers, 
who are just using frameworks, they should be learning how to use real HTML. So if you're going to be writing a framework, use HTML in your code. Don't just obfuscate everything. Use it as a teaching moment. OK, so why am I talking about the radio button? Because this is done with radio buttons. Here I have a carousel, and um, it, it works. I'm, right now I'm hitting the left arrow, the up arrow, the down arrow, the right arrow. Right? Beautiful. Oh. Not really, just su su stupidly simple. Originally, Visa, this was their code, and they had to reinstall all the semantics for everything, right? Div class item role option tab index zero, aria selected equals true, aria label, blah, 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 blah. This is my version. Let's put a field set in to say to the user um, with a legend, select an address to edit, and then I created a label with a for attribute, and then I created um, radio buttons with IDs that match the for. And then my CSS basically said, depending on the class of the parent, just translate the content over. And I did a little bit of stuff, so I didn't have to actually write everything out, because this was annoying to write out, because um, it actually goes to 20. Um, so I just did it here, uh, used a little bit of SAS magic. And this is the amount of JavaScript that went into it, which is on change, uh, set the attribute of the parent to a different class. So I changed, I, they didn't have to pull in jQuery or their entire carousel framework. Instead, I used radio buttons. Um, so it had some features. It used the appropriate semantics. The label were descriptive. It had states. The keyboard was, there was keyboard support. And the, key, the focus state was clearly visible. So all the accessibility features were matched. It matched all the carousel concepts. It works you know, with uh, other pretty things, right? The thing is, it's not actually a carousel. The reason it's not a carousel is because when I had people with screen readers read this, they're like, it's not a carousel. And they couldn't see it, so it's like, why isn't it a carousel? Because well, it works. Um, so there was nothing, I didn't put any aria in there, it just was an unordered list of addresses, and they could understand everything and select everything. So. The next feature where I used radio buttons was this little thing right here. Um, Visa's thing did section role option tab index negative one, aria selected equals false. I did input type radio name. They all have the same name. They all have different IDs with different values, and they all have a label that points to it. And that is semantic HTML. It's super easy to write. Everyone can understand it, and no one needs to import a framework. Um, a little bit of CSS, uh, hiding of the little button, making sure that there's focus. This third example I'm going to use uh, show is completely different. It doesn't use it uses uh, CSS as well um, for a little bit of magic, and it uses 125 lines of JavaScript. So uh, here I'm just going to make it green, so you can see that these input masks are uh, work, and then I'm just going to type stuff. And you'll see that it works. And then I'm going to copy and paste. And you'll see that it works. OK, so that works. Instead of doing this one, which was pulling in jQuery at 37.7 minified and pulling in jQuery input mask bundle at 30. Oh, so I'm, I'm saving almost 70 kilobytes um, for three kilobytes. I, 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 it, it's auto knitting now, so it it's actually went up. So what did I use? I used plain HTML. This is an input. It says input ID zipped, type telephone, name zip code, class masked. The only thing it needs is a class of masked. And then the JavaScript says, hey, find all the ones with masked. It creates a shell around it and adds a span that is hidden from the screen readers that is actually the mask. And the way the mask works is, with JavaScript, every time a key is entered, it checks the regular expression. Does it match the regular expression? Oh, it does match the regular expression. This key is valid. Um, it puts it into the little I, which is transparent. So the part one, two, three is transparent in the back. Like the, the, the part above is the mask. The part inside the input is the actual value. 
uh, the part that's pink, or the one, two, three in the mask is transparent, so it goes one, two, three, X, X. That's how it works. Um, I hid the placeholder, so that's a little bit of CSS that's important to know, and I hid the spam from the cited users. So one thing with using tricks and CSS is you have to really realize that changing the, um, you know, there are some tricks that make it a little bit more difficult, but changing the layout actually does change the semantics when it comes to tables. So when I do table display grid, it is no longer read by screen readers as a table. So instead of using 55 JavaScript libraries, just use a little bit of CSS and an actual table element to create a table that has a left column that is static and a header and footer that is static. And this does use a little bit of JavaScript, um, and you can check it out uh, on my code pen. Um, but I can't really go to details on it because um, it's kind of out of time. So what I want you to do is I want you to think outside the box. Think of frameworks as scaffolding. Obviously, if you're doing a web app, you, need, you might need a framework. But you don't need 43 dependencies. So think outside the box and realize that if you're using native HTML, Semantically, your site's going to be faster, it's going to be simple to write, and it's going to be accessible. And if all else fails, you do have ARIA. So here's the ARIA spec, and here are some resources. And if you want to rewrite that widget, we are hiring. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, this is where you can find me. So thank you very much.